welcome to Mount Side. Good to see everybody. Merry Christmas. And thank you, Kathleen, for doing our announcements. I want to highlight Propel as, um, as well that uh, the women sign up for that. <clears throat> it's going to be a good launch to, uh, to helping women, uh, specifically in their discipleship. So um, also thank you, Christy Briggs, for making all of the food out there for us, all of the bread. We appreciate that. And um, don't miss, when's Christmas Eve? Christmas is a Saturday. Friday, Christmas Eve, don't miss the service here at 7 p.m. We would love to see you there. So, um, let's see. Normally I do announcements, so I'm thrown off right now. Normally I've cracked, <laughs> I've cracked like four jokes and I'm well on my way. So, um, let's see. Good to see everybody. I wanted to correct something as part of my sermon. I do this uh, symbols of Christmas, not every year, but I've done it in, in previous years. Um, and um, the reason I do a symbols of Christmas sermon is because I find more and more that Christmas is seemingly lost. In fact, I just heard on the, there was an ad or something I heard on, I don't know if it was K-Love or what, but um, someone said that Walmart had petitioned or someone had pet petitioned to stop calling them Christmas trees, to call them holiday trees. <clears throat> and I thought, it's funny that um, the unsaved world would look at a Christmas tree and think like that stands for Christianity. It's fascinating to me. And it's just interesting when our worlds all collide around the, uh, the Christmas season, we have, I've got uh, people who need Jesus saying, you can't call it a Christmas tree. You need to call it a holiday tree because that stands for Christianity. And then you got Christians yelling, we can't even find Christ in Christmas anymore. So everybody's looking for something different. So um, if you are looking for Christ in Christmas, then this is the sermon for you. I wanted to put this up first. Let me put up that first slide. Um, I'm sure each of you have seen these uh, signs. Can we put that up? Keep Christ in Christmas. You, there, there, there's bumper stickers, and there's, um, I've seen this in different places. Keep Christ in Christmas. Jesus is the reason for the season. Christmas, not Xmas. Has anybody seen any of those bumper stickers or signs or anything? Okay. So, um, obviously, there are Christians out there who, who don't feel that Jesus is the reason for the season anymore, and they want to tell people that. I think what's funny is that us as Christians, we do a good job of forgetting Jesus. We just, we just do that. We're running around, shopping for lots of gifts, going into credit card debt, which we shouldn't be, and we can forget in all of the business what we're actually celebrating this time of year. I wanted to correct the last one, and I want to give you some quick theology as well. Can we put up that next slide? Uh, Matthew 1.16 says this, And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Christ. So Christos is the name Christ, Christos, capital X. Um, for centuries, <clears throat> X, that X was used for shorthand for Christ. So people, instead of writing out Christos, would put, an, put a capital X. So I, wanna, I just wanted to correct this quick, that if you see Xmas, that X is like thousand-year Christian shorthand for Jesus. So don't get super upset on that one, because the X was always shorthand for there is, there is Jesus Christ. I thought that's interesting. Uh, one of the things we're going to try to do in today's sermon is we're going to talk about things we reject, things we received, and things we redeem. And this is one with proper understanding we can actually accept and, and redeem this uh, when you see Christos. So, <clears throat> um, I wanted to talk about six symbols of Christmas. We have some of these symbols um, in our sanctuary or out in our foyer as well. Um, so I just wanted to um, talk about six symbols, and I wanted to talk about what we can do 
to kind of refocus our family, refocus our energy back on Christ during uh, this Christmas season. And I'm, I'm asking you to pay attention and to write maybe one or two of these down and say this at your home with your family. Okay, number one, the Christmas tree. It's interesting that traditions on how we got a Christmas tree, how did we get a Christmas tree in our homes? I have read more about Christmas trees than I care to read about Christmas trees. And let me tell you, everybody has a different story of how we came to everyone having a Christmas tree in their home. Most likely, it started off from absolute pagans celebrating the winter solstice. Uh, Their trees were always evergreens because they thought that an evergreen had magical powers to fight off the death of winter. Christians have quoted me this verse. I'm going to read it in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 2. It's actually verses 2 through 4. Thus says the Lord, Learn not the way of the nations, nor be dismayed at the signs of the heavens, because the nations are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vanity. A tree from the forest is cut down. And worked with an axe by the hands of a craftsman. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with hammer and nails so that it cannot move. So has anybody ever been quoted an Old Testament verse as a Christian? You're like, "Mm, I'm not so sure that applies to today or not. I've been quoted a lot of those. And let me tell you that this one does not apply. So once again, what Jeremiah, what the prophets of old were speaking about was paganism, idolatry. So what people in Jeremiah's day were doing, pagan nations, were taking trees, carving them, making them idols, and bringing new idols into their homes. And so that tree carved with an axe and brought into a home and overlaid was not talking about a Christmas tree. It was talking about a pagan idol. And so uh, when we talk about idolatry, I also think we kind of mess this up. We think, oh, that's so stupid. Idolatry is so dumb. That's so easy not to do. I would never be an idolater. I would never, ever do that. I would never be so stupid to bring a tree or bring a carved image or an idol or a statue in my home and like bow down to it three times a day and say a prayer to it. That sounds stupid. Hopefully you understand that idolatry is much bigger than We have idols in our driveways. We've had idols uh, around our homes. We have idols as our homes. We worship our children. We worship our spouses. We worship our work. We worship our hobbies. We worship our favorite NFL teams. We worship and we worship and we worship and we worship these things. And I'm not saying you bow down to it, but I'm saying your time, your talent, and your treasure is often going to an idol that's in your life instead of to Jesus Christ. And that we have to be careful of. And so this verse is not talking about this. You're not a pagan for bringing a tree into your home. So I wanted to talk about this, and then this applies to each of the six symbols, I'm gonna, but I'm going to pause with the Christmas tree. Reject, receive, or redeem. Um, Jesus came to reject the world, right? No. Jesus came to receive the world, right? No. Jesus came to what? Redeem the world, to save the world. In evangelical Christianity today, what I see is a lot of reject and receive, and I don't see a lot of redeem. And if you don't have any measure of redemption in your life, where you're trying to redeem relationships, redeem different things, I would say that you're lacking a piece of the heart of God. We need to be looking to redeem situations. Certainly there are things that we need to reject. There are things in this world that we say, nope, that is, that is sin, that does not belong in my life, in my home. There are also things that we can receive. They're wonderful, good, godly things. But there's a lot of things in the middle that not only, uh, not only should we try to receive and redeem, 
but we should praise that God is using those in our life or in the life of others. We're going to get to that here in a moment. So, um, when it comes to Christmas, it's easy to have really strong opinions about things. Um, I, I still know people who are like, nope, absolutely not, a tree is pagan. The problem with that is you don't leave a lot of room for redemption in your current culture. If we were talking about Jesus Christ, when Jesus was here on earth, did he reject everything? He didn't reject everything. Did he receive everything? He didn't receive everything. But he often redeemed things. And I just want to challenge us to begin to think about that. So here's the earliest tr a Christian tradition of a tree. Martin Luther, who was the great reformer, cut down a tree and brought it into his house but we don't have a lot of Christian tradition behind a Christmas tree. So, how can we see the gospel in a tree? One, a tree is an evergreen, which stands for eternal life in Jesus Christ. Two, a Christmas tree is a wonderful symbol of the first tree that Adam and Eve sinned at, and the last tree that Jesus Christ died on. And three, cutting down and raising up a tree could be symbolic of the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. I say this for this reason. I don't think we should just celebrate Christmas every single year the same exact way and we just put up a tree, drink our eggnog, fill it with presents, let the kids open presents, pay off our credit cards. I just don't think that that's going to be the most beneficial to your family over the years. I think moms and dads, you need to speak the gospel to yourself and you need to speak the gospel to your kids. And you can use something as simple as a tree. Just say, hey kids, we're going to talk about a Christmas tree. Why do we have it up and what does it symbolize? Put some symbolism behind it. Second, Christmas lights. The lights on a Christmas tree seem to have a better Christian tradition than the actual tree. Once again, Martin Luther saw one night coming home, he saw lights from the stars going through evergreens in the forest, and he thought it looked really cool. So he went home and got a bunch of candles and fixed the candles to the evergreen that was in his home for Christmas, and he lit all of those candles to give the same effect inside of his home. A bunch of people followed him, and a bunch of people's homes burned down. Which, why, which is why back in Martin Luther's day, people did not put up their tree until December 24th. That was pretty typical. We in America like to put our trees up at, like, Halloween, so we can celebrate Thanksgiving slash Christmas, so that we can celebrate Christmas, and then we leave our lights on our home all year round. And then so July 4th, we can turn on our Christmas lights. So we don't really do a good job. We like overlay all of this. Home Depot, I think, had trees. I swear I saw some Christmas decorations at Home Depot well before Thanksgiving this year, like, like at least four to six weeks. So Christmas lights, electric lights, were used the first time in 1882 when Edward Johnson, an associate of Thomas Edison, hand-wired 80 red, white, and blue bulbs and wound them around a rotating Christmas tree. In 1895, President Grover Cleveland set up a lighted tree in the White House and the general public began to take notice since then, and the tradition began. Now, there's not much behind lights, except that they're pretty. We have pagans who brought in evergreens into their home, but it took Martin Luther to light the tree up. So here's the symbolism I would like us to see in a Christmas tree, and the Christmas tree lights is John 8, 12. Then Jesus said, I and the light of the world. He who, he who follows me will not walk in the darkness, will have the light of life. One thing that we do really well at Christmas is we light things up. It's fantastic. And every time you see a light, you should be thinking, that light 
points me to the light, the light that Jesus brought not only to this world, but brought to my heart as well, as I have repented of my sin and I have trusted in Jesus as my Savior. So first, a tree. Second, lights. Third, a star or angel on top of the tree. I would really encourage this. I would say if you're a Christian family, we're going to make this a closed-handed position. I'm totally joking. I would encourage you to put stars and angels on tops of trees. Um, that's pretty standard. Um, but here's the symbol. This symbol is pretty rich in Christian history. As soon as Christians start, started bringing trees into their homes, as soon as Christians started lighting those trees up, they immediately put um, either st a star or an angel on top of their tree. And the reason is to announce the birth of Jesus. Uh, let me just read Luke chapter 2, uh, verse 8. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. I think it would be important that we put an angel or a star on top of our tree as a symbol that a star led who? To Jesus, the wise men. And an angel announced the birth of Jesus. Remember, we've talked about angels a little bit here in the past few weeks. Angels are very powerful beings. So if an angel that could wipe out an entire city announced your birth, I'm guessing you would be a pretty important person. And Jesus is a pretty important person. So when you see that star or angel on top of the tree, I want you to think, a star and an angel. Extremely powerful things announced the birth of my Savior, God who has come to earth. And I should be humble and respectful and obedient to my new Lord. Fourth, gifts. You probably remember the story of the gifts that the Magi brought Gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Symbolism, gold, symbolizes Christ's kingship. Frankincense symbolizes Christ's priestship. And myrrh symbolizes Christ's death. By the way, uh, just to correct your manger scene, the wise men were at Jesus' birth. False, they weren't. So the wise men would have been there later. And I always thought, what did Mary do with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You'd think she could have used like diapers and formula and I don't know, right? So I actually think what happened, because right after the wise men come, where do Mary and Joseph end up going? They have to flee, right? Because a madman is trying to kill baby boys. By the way, we don't harm babies. The Bible's really, really clear about that. We don't harm children. We don't harm one another. So when a madman goes to murder babies, Mary and Joseph end up fleeing to Egypt. I actually think that by that time, Mary and Joseph, who don't have a lot of money, have to flee and run to Egypt, have to disappear for a period of time, I actually think they sold the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I think they cashed that out in order to pay for their trip and their travel. Now, I could be wrong. I doubt it. Mostly I'm right. But I could be wrong about that. But I say it this way. God will always provide for you. It might not be in the way that you saw fit in that moment, but he will always provide for you. And it would be much like God to provide for Mary and Joseph ahead of their trip that maybe they couldn't have afforded. I don't know. But God provided for them, and God will provide for you. So gifts. This is what Christmas is all about, right? Good gifts. 
This is probably why we all don't like parts of Christmas, is because of that pressure and the runaround and the finding of the gift and the fighting and the spending. And guess what? None of it's really needed. I mean, a gift is fine. I've asked you to do this. I've asked you, please don't put yourself in debt over a gift. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense to dishonor God with your finances in order to give a gift in order to celebrate the birth of baby Jesus. That, that's not right. But I will say this as a father. I said this at the men's breakfast on, um, what is it, the third Thursday of every month? The third Thursday of every month is now men's, men's breakfast. It used to be a really not a very good breakfast because I made it. And now it's a fantastic breakfast because four men stepped up and are leading uh, that team. And they'll be providing breakfast uh, third Thursday. Kathleen, it was close to the women's. It really was. So um, not, not quite as good, but it was, it was right there. But when I made it, not so much. So um, I said this at the men's breakfast. I'm not sure there's a man I've ever met who's super giddy over Christmas or like getting a gift. I mean, I appreciate a thoughtful gift or whatever, and that's fine, but can we just be honest that we're adults now when we buy what we need? If we really wanted it, you just go buy it. There is something to something thoughtful. I, I know that. But as a husband and a father, I'll tell you what my favorite part of Christmas is getting that gift. Doesn't matter the value. It could be something really small. It could be something bigger. Where you're sitting there and your kid, and as they get older, they're, you're, they're losing this, and your kid is going to open it, and you're like, oh, you're literally waiting there like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm, about, to drop the, I'm about to drop the mic on this whole party. Because when they open this gift, they're going to love it so much, and it's going to bring me more joy than any gift I could have ever received. I hope you know that feeling as an adult. That's a great feeling. Those gifts are cool. They point to the gift of our Savior. I think we all forget that. They do. But let me challenge each and every one of you. I was talking to my dad. I always say like the other day, this was probably three years ago. And, um, and thank you, Allison. Allison was like, hey, did you see how nice your dad is dressed today? And I'm like, yes, honey. She always wants to dress me like my father. So <laughs> literally sends me things on Amazon like your dad would wear this and you would look nice in this also, I think. So my dad told me the other day, you know what? What I find now with whatever money I have, I could buy myself something and it's almost meaningless now. But if I help someone or I give that money to someone who's in need or I do something with that money, it fills my heart with just this joy and this peace that I could never get if I bought my, myself something. That's true. We cannot forget that. I'm telling you this as you get older and older and older, you need to be a person who has your finances under control and can begin to bless other people and help other people as you see needs arise. I'm telling you, it will fill your heart way more full than anything that you could purchase for yourself. So as we give gifts, let's not get caught up in that, but let's admit that that gift is a representation of the great gift of salvation that Jesus Christ bought for us. Number five, stockings. Here's what I think about stockings. And it's so American, it's not even funny. Here's what we do as Americans. We're going to bring in a tree and we're going to fill it. Now, we're going to fill it with gifts, just as many gifts as we can. So we're going to fill this with gifts. And then because we're Americans, we need extra gifts. So we have gifts and then we have our bonus gifts because the 
the tree's not large enough for our gifts, so we have bonus gifts in a sock just hanging somewhere. It's fantastic. Like, kids, before you get to all the gifts that we overspent on, we want you to first open your bonus gifts because you're all just fantastic. And we have all the money in the world and we just want to fill you up with stuff and gifts. And everything in the stocking is what? Total garbage. Gum, candy. You give a, you give a kid a pack of gum 360 odd days a year and the kid goes, whatever. You put gum in a stocking at Christmas morning, kid's like, boom! This is fantastic. Thank you, mom and dad, for the, the gum in my stocking. It's super lame of all of us. It just, I just admit it. I'd rather say it, but we can give meaning to it. Okay. I continue to run in the same story about stockings. A fable of old was that St. Nicholas was concerned about three sisters. They lived on the outskirts of the city, and they were poor and destitute. The sister's father was unable to pay a dowry for the girls to be married, so they faced a tough life ahead. The saint, St. Nicholas, was determined to save the sisters from a horrible life. One night, it is told, that he dropped three pieces of gold through the chimney. The coins did not fall into the hearth, but fell into the girls' stockings, which had been hung near the fire. They were elated to find the money in the morning. If you believe that, I have some land to sell you in the middle of Nevada. I don't have any Bible verses about stockings. I'm not sure anybody wore socks. So how can we redeem stockings? Here's the best I have. We hang up an empty stocking on Christmas Eve and we await Christ to come and fill them. An empty stocking represents a lost and shattered condition that without Christ, we face a disastrous end. But when Christ comes, he fills us, he completes us, he saves us, and he leads us. That's pretty lame. That's the best I got. All right. And finally is um, candy canes. So if you, are, uh, if you can walk... If you're, a, if you're a child, I'm going to, so the way I define a child, have I ever told you how I define a child? It's uh, if you don't pay your own bills. So if you don't pay your own bills, I have candy canes at the communion. Why don't you come on up and grab a candy cane? Everybody who doesn't pay their own bills, um, come up, and grab a candy cane. I'm begging you, please. Someone's got to start. They're all, I've got too many for you. So all the kids come forward and grab a candy cane. And I'm going to teach you about a candy cane. <laughs> so that was our first round. And then if you're retired, <laughs> I'm joking. So candy canes for all. There's candy canes over here too if we run out. All right. So we all have a candy cane. Yes, absolutely. And there's, we got some more over here too. We got a whole bunch. So candy canes. Candy canes have been around for centuries, but it wasn't until around 1900 that they were decorated with red stripes and bent into the shape of a cane. They were sometimes handed out at church service to keep the children quiet. That's one of my favorite things ever right there. You know what I find fascinating is we, 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 Christians are so funny. So I've been to churches where the, we, we normally have um, kids in Sunday school, whatever you call it. We send them out in the street and they run around and then we tell them about the Bible. So we normally have Sunday school for kids. We have everybody in the service for, for Christmas, but I've had people say, well, you know, kids nowadays, they can't sit in church, and so we should make them sit in church, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, I don't know. It's kind of annoying at times, and you know, if they can be preach the gospel at their level, great. 
What's funny is that in the 1900s, children are so unruly, parents are like, just suck on a candy cane. For crying out loud, just be quiet and suck on a candy cane, you're good. I think that's hilarious. In other words, no generation is any better than the next generation. I get tired of hearing, well, in my generation, every kid was great. In your generation, they're all terrible. Now, nah, we're all terrible, and we're all regular human beings. So I just love the fact that way back in the day, when you would picture like a kid sitting in church like, right? Like it's the 1900s. They've got dust, they've got like ash in their faith. The, the kid worked in the coal mine all week, and so he comes to church, right? No, he needed a candy cane also. So you get a candy cane today. One story is as follows. In the late 1800s, a candy maker in Indiana wanted to express the meaning of Christmas through the symbol made of candy. He came up with the idea of bending one of his white candy sticks into the shape of a candy cane. He incorporated several symbols of Christ's love and sacrifice through the candy cane. First, he used a plain white peppermint stick. The color white symbolizes the purity and sinless nature of Jesus. Second, he added stripes to symbolize the pain inflicted upon Jesus before his death on the cross. Third, when he looked at the, cro the crook on top, it reminded him of a shepherd's staff because Jesus is the shepherd of men. And if you turn it upside down, it becomes the letter J, symbolizing the first letter in Jesus' name. This is a simple thing. Every kid should get candy at Christmas. Put some candy canes out and explain the gospel to your children in something that's so simple. So, I say all this because Christmas can be a time that's not the most peaceful, really hectic, really busy, people running around. We made a huge mistake yesterday and went to the Legends Mall on a Saturday at 1 p.m., the Saturday before Christmas. Are you kidding me? We came home and my wife says to me, Dawson, you know the greatest thing we ever bought? No. She says, Amazon Prime. <laughs> Just fantastic. Men, you can get stuff in one day. You, you can wait four, four more days before you start shopping if you just use Amazon Prime. It's fantastic. But I'm out there, we're hon I'm honking at people. Ladies are backing up. I shouldn't say lady, I didn't mean that. A person, definitely what I said, definitely does not mean that women are worse drivers in any sense or way of the fashion. A person was backing into me. We're trying to find parking spot. It's a disaster. Every line, every person, everyone running around. No wonder we hate Christmas. We need to take a step back and realize this is all about Jesus Christ. It really has nothing to do with us. I would encourage you to take this. We're going to sing now. We're going to, we're going to worship. I would ask you to take this time, take a deep breath, and just remind yourself what we're really supposed to be about this Christmas season. Let's pray. Father God, I do thank you for the gift of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, from me, who from eternity past raised his hand and offered up himself as our sacrifice for sin. Though these symbols might be silly at times, they can still point us in the right direction. Father, we want to worship you now. And we want to take a deep breath and remind ourselves that Christmas really isn't about any of these things. Christmas is about your son. I can't imagine how the second person of the Trinity, fully God, co-equal and co-eternal with the Father, could humble himself so deeply that he would become like one of us. And yet, Father, at times, we won't humble ourselves to do the dishes. God, I would ask that we are, if we say that we are Christian, then by our actions, we would actually follow Jesus. It's in his name that we pray.